nature, nature, make more noise. <laughs> A bit of classic behaviour of the robin there, and if you, you caught that, it was there was the one robin hopping around here saying, "Where's my breakfast?" And then another one swooped in and chased it away. And it's this kind of weather. It's cold, but it's sunny, and that makes them think, "Oh, I don't know. Sometime we're going to breed, and this is going to be my patch." So they're already getting a bit aggressive with one another. When it gets colder, they they, they can't afford to fight. Then calm down, share your food. But this is meadow sweet, which is a lovely plant which gets higher and higher and higher, reaching for the sun, and then it gets these lovely little white feathery flowers on it. And it is, as it said, it's got a lovely sort of scent. And it really got its name years and years and years ago when London in particular was very smelly and nasty and people were always having something they could sniff to take the smell away. Um, and meadow sweet was one of those flowers that got used for that. They'd wrap some me meadow sweet in a piece of cloth and go, ah, that's better. It reminds me of wild flowers instead of dirt and horse dung and things like that, which would have been all over the place in those days. So take my word for it. That's actually quite a nice patch of wild flowers. Another little clue there, another little tip there a patch of wild flowers. You've always got room. It can be quite small. This is the damp one. This is St John's wort, which will have little yellow flowers on. It's used in all sorts of medicines as well. You can buy that, go down the chemist and say, I want some St John's wort. Well, that's what the flower looks like. This, this, this is a classic example. I, I wish I could show you straight up. I'm going to make his head a bit obvious, more obvious. This is sort of an eagle owl or something like that. It's not a very accurate one, whatever it is, but the point is, the, you know, people see that and they think, oh, is that there to scare birds off? People put them on airports, don't they, to keep away birds from the runways. But I'm afraid it doesn't really work for that because birds are not stupid. And I've got pictures of, oh, Imagine a, 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 a blue tit, a great tit, a robin, a wren. I've got all those things perched on the head of this guy, and they know it's not real. It's not real, you know. So uh, I always rather wonder about this. There's uh, birds of prey that get put on for safety reasons, because I, I, I can't imagine they really work, frankly. Uh, this, this is another example. <laughs> This is another example of a created specialist habitat for flowers. Now offhand you might think, what do you mean, a sink? Um, or a fairyland by the look, a bit of whimsy there. No, I'm, what it is is a sort of um, chalky soil. I added a lot of chalk, chalky type soil there because there are many, many flowers that um, that belong on chalk downland, which is lovely, lovely habitat, that big word again, um, to clomp around in summer. And there's so many beautiful flowers that absolutely love that kind of place. Um, and many of them are sweet smelling, many of them are herbs used in cooking and so on and so forth. And they're also great for butterflies. So underneath there, that is chalky earth, my mini downland, and as this begins to grow up, this is Bethany. That's uh, sounds like somebody's name now. It's Bethany, isn't it? Yeah. But that's that's uh, that's a lovely flower. The little purple flowers on there. There's several other things. There. Little harebells will come out eventually. But you need to come back in. Uh, what should we say? June. We'll see you in June. We we'll make that. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 But, uh, it's it's so satisfying, you know. You 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 become <laughs> sort of delusions here, but you, you you become the creator. You know, say I I want some chalk downlands. All right, it's only about two foot square, but you can have some. Make it yourself. Do it. I think in many ways the days of conservation are sadly a little bit numbered because you know the part of the point we're trying to make is is obviously wait. Well, how much wildlife has um, decreased, or in some cases completely disappeared. But the only places where our wildlife is flourishing, and this is really more or less all around the world, are what, for want of a better word, you would call 
a nature reserve. You know, now that is creating something. That is where somebody like the RSPB or the Wildlife Trusts, there's all sorts of terrific organisations who actually can buy a piece of land and then manage it. And I've always said that managing a, a, a reserve is really just wildlife gardening on a big scale. And I've, I belong to an organisation, for example, called the World Land Trust, which it started off as uh, um, the children's rainforest. It was in Costa Rica. And now they've spread all around the world to different areas and they buy land and local people who are interested in wildlife look after it. And it's, it's I hesitate to call it a zoo. It isn't a zoo and I'm not against zoos, but they are sanctuaries. That's a good word, isn't it? Sanctuary. And sanctuary means somewhere where people and wildlife, in this case, are safe. And that's what this is all about, actually. And the little sanctuaries, which we nearly all have, are our gardens, or our backyards, or even just our window boxes. That's, we've all got little sanctuaries, which I think we should congratulate ourselves for. And they are actually one of the most success, one of the few really improving, if anything, one of the areas that is actually improving. We're losing so much in terms of forests and marshes and, uh, and grasslands and so on and so forth. And nearly all the birds, oh, I just saw a wood mouse then, but I tell you, never get onto that. It just... See if you can pick these up. Look, look up in the willow tree and there's two blue tits. And there's another one below. No, it's the drop down. We'll, we'll, we'll get them as we go. Because that's a robin singing, by the way. And it may sound very gentle and peaceful, but he's actually saying, I want my food, Bill, for heaven's sake, I want my food. Well, I've got it. He'll probably, the robin will probably prefer, prefer what's in here. But here's my little feeding station. Let's have a look at that. Right. So. I've found that really only about three or four different types of food are necessary. Um, these are sunflower hearts and so you'd expect blue tits and great tits to come on the feeder. But you wouldn't expect robins to do it, but I've seen a robin hovering, like there was one in the garden just now, hovering over it like a flycatcher does and grabbing at these things. And much more entertaining though, I've seen big birds like the pigeons, who are not entirely welcome, they're not really meant to be here, those aren't wild pigeons, but they're lazy pigeons, put it that way, they're lazy pigeons, they're just going to come in and grab what's ever around. But watching magpies and jays trying to feed on these things and the parakeets will feed on these things but the big birds magpies and jays are not meant to dangle they're too big to dangle that should be their 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 um, catchphrase you know too big to dangle but they still try and they fall off a lot and <laughs> that's quite entertaining to be perfectly honest <laughs> anyway over here Oh, this one's still, I must have done this yesterday afternoon, there's plenty still in there. So he's all right. Okay, mealworm time. Mealworm time. Okay, mealworm time. <laughs> Give myself impossible things to say. Right, uh, we'll come across here. I'll do these ones. Do you want to, you don't, it's okay having these things in shot, isn't it, to a point, anyway. There's a badger in shot, that's always a good theme. Right, now, first of all, if you have any squeamishness about sort of wriggly wiggly things and creepy crawlies as they're called, I wish they weren't, you know. They always do that, don't they? Especially in children's wildlife things, or if you go to uh, an open day or a book about uh, about wildlife and you go, and they always call them creepy crawlies, which I think in a way is a shame, because it makes uh, it makes you think, yeah, yeah, you know, that's the first reaction, yeah. I have more than once revealed the contents of this and this, this, by the way, they slightly they nibble on newspaper, and they also wee and poo on it as well. So it's a bit 
stop the this one. Put that on there. There you go. All together now. Yeah, yeah. Actually, they're pretty quiet. They are a They are alive, by the way, but they're a bit cold. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, but the fact of the matter is, small insects and caterpillars and that sort of thing are absolutely essential for birds. And this is very important. They're particularly essential, not during the winter when everybody traditionally feeds birds but during the spring and the summer when there are young birds around and some bir young birds still in the nest. So I had robins, blackbirds, uh, wren, all nesting in different places in this garden and it saved the parents, if you think about it, a huge amount of effort and work and energy. They didn't have to go, you know, looking for insects and, and caterpillars under leaves. It's, it's a big, big job to do that and they get exhausted and they, they sometimes literally can't survive because they've got too much to do. But if you put these things out, it's, it's an absolute godsend. So Robin will come in and we have a blackbird, that's right, the best one was a blackbird, who got something like, he used to pick them up, but he didn't just do one at a time. And I don't know how he didn't keep dropping them, but he ended up with about 10 of those in his beak. <laughs> he'd come down and he'd go off and you could imagine the female was back there saying, oh, well done, darling, that's good. Go for 12. And then he'd come back and have another lot. And I got lots of nice pictures of him, absolutely, you know, sort of a whole beak for a whole row of wiggly mealworms, thinking, don't feed us to your babies. It is your destiny. The only way I can feed these, put them in their thing, because this, oh, it's full of nonsense, isn't it? This thing here is not part of the feeder. It's um, a plant, plant thing that you normally hang down and have plants and flowers in. But if I leave that feeder open like that, magpies, jays, squirrels, everything will come and nick those. But that is very effective, only small birds can get in there, so it'll be robins and uh, blue tits and grey tits. And the same applies over here, the same applies to this feeder, which these are very, very, I do recommend these. If people have trouble with squirrels and so on and so forth, I mean, I like squirrels, but yes, they do take a lot of food, but you put that in there, <laughs> And as you can see, it's got these, just these little holes there. And it took the birds a couple of days, I think. That's about all to sort of suss it out. They don't look at that and say, what's that for, you know? What's this mealworm cage you've got here? Is he keeping mealworms now? And then one of the more seasoned blue tits or something. No, 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 that's a, that's a squirrel-proof feeder. We go inside, get it. And I've seen birds a bit puzzled getting out. They, <laughs> and every now and again, you'd, you'd see a robin as it goes in there and you'd, oh, great, got my, got my mealworm. And then they go and, uh, how do I get out of here? And eventually they'll find one of these holes and whew, thank goodness for that. All of which is part of the fun, actually. You know, from your point of view, watching what the birds are doing in your garden and almost giving them personalities. I mean, I don't, I don't give them names, but lots of people do. But I think most people who have a garden and enjoy the birds tend to, the big word is anthropomorphize. Anthropomorphize, go on, Google that one. Anthropomorphize, it's, and it basically, it means giving sort of human name and a human behavior um, to an animal or a bird or something like that. So, um, you know, in terms of garden birds, it's very often people talk about my robins come back, you know, I call him Peter or something like that, or uh, Ralph or whatever, and he's come back again, you know, and then they said, he's, I, really, he's come back every year. Oh, yes, yes, he comes back. Peter's been coming to our garden for 15 years now. And then I have to say, ah, it's probably not Peter, you know, it's son of Peter and grandson of Peter and so on and so forth. Because it's something I'm often asked, how 
long do garden birds live and the small ones I'm afraid the the answer it sounds very sad but whilst they are alive they live a life they're fast they pack a lot in but it's usually they're lucky to live more than about three four years at the most and most of them probably only about two so if you want to call it your garden robin that's cool but it might not be the same one every year okay right right sad note the question i'm often asked actually is have things changed and how have they changed since i was a kid well we're talking phew, 60 years ago or more and uh, the answer is yes 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 and yes and 90% of the changes unfortunately have not been for the good i mean i often think i know children and indeed adults are always reading in the papers or magazines or you know sort of uh, maybe the bulletin from a, from an organization something like that about how many species we've lost whether it's birds or butterflies or bees or anything anything and it's all around the world too that we are losing species nature is being more and more destroyed um, and it's hard though for young people to appreciate that because they hear that but how could they possibly know it and if i can put it this way you have to be as old as me and i suggest you don't be as old as me for another 60 years or so by the way but um if you are then i remember for example walking in the fields round about Birmingham where I lived and there would be huge numbers of birds, masses of birds. Every field I would go through during the winter had big flocks of sparrows and buntings, there'd be lapwing flocks and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of life and during the summer it would be the same with the butterflies and the bees and the flowers and so on and so forth. And therefore I guess people of my age really are very aware of how much we're losing. Whereas youngsters, you can't be. You've only got our word for it in a way. What's that? <laughs> I'm gonna pause while that happens. If it's going to, is it going away? Oh, it sounds like it is almost, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. When I were a lad, we had birds all over the place, you know, and had butterflies all over, and I did, I did live up north in those days. And, uh, and, and I can imagine youngsters going, oh, for heaven's sake. But one thing I have to say is that nowadays people have information and um, help in a way which I never had. And that's good. And uh, this is the thing to appreciate. You know, you may be at a school which has, for example, a natural history um, club of some sort, which goes out the, uh, on outings to local nature reserve. Uh, you may have a school wildlife garden, which is even better. And you are allowed to decide what goes in the garden and, uh, and figure out, you know, which species you want there. And then uh, pair binoculars and uh, a computer to identify everything and keep records of it you know the, the 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 things that are available to youngsters these days frankly are fantastic fantastic I had and I promise you when I was let's say 10 something like that and started bird watching and I'd, I'd got into it myself and got interested um, there was only one book there was one little book called the observer's book of birds which had about 40 or 50 species in it. Um, I've seen more than 50 species in this garden, so they must have missed a few out. And, and nowadays, there's just wonderful, wonderful books and websites and so forth. I'm not advertising, it's just I admire this book, for example, immensely. Garden Wildlife, a quick flick through that, and we'll do that like that, and then we'll show you some pictures. Yeah. And a quick, you know, you realise the great variety that you get in virtually any garden or just a yard with a little patio or something like that, you know. And it's not just the birds, it's the, the butterflies, the moths, the insects, the animals, the builders, yeah, <laughs> which I'm going to see if I can chase away later. Um, and you've got a book here, fantastic illustrations. You say, oh yes, I think it's this. No, it isn't, it's this one, you know. So, uh, 
that, that's country blessings time. And, and schools nowadays, without a doubt, are far, far, far more informed and organised and helpful. And uh, I would go so far as to say it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's wrong, it's bad if a school isn't. You know, I've, so, I've been to many, many, many schools and gone to their wildlife gardens and so on and so forth and seen their projects. And if I go to a, a school and find they're not doing anything like that, you say, oh, come on, you know, no excuse. If you've got any space at all, you can have bird feeders or you can have a mini flower garden or, you know, a herb garden and so on and so forth. So schools, please get involved. It always requires at least one really enthusiastic brilliant teacher and there always is one somewhere so if it's you fess up get involved <laughs>